Today, I am joined by Elon Bachman. Uh, he is an anonymous Twitter personality and a writer. Welcome, Elon. Hi. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm happy to have you on. Um, like I said in the preamble to this, I, I really enjoy your posts, and I'm, I'm glad we can uh, make this happen. Um, I think you are someone who's probably still in a minority, if I'm maybe not... Um, misunderstanding your position, um, because I think you're still maybe loosely associated with libertarianism, a movement that a lot of people who swim in our waters kind of have distanced themselves from. So I'd like to just kind of see what what's your relationship to libertarianism? What is still interesting about it for you? Is there anything that is not interesting about it anymore? Um, just just kind of trying to to map out kind of what your journey has been. Yeah, um, I think my journey is the same journey that draws a lot of, you know, I don't want to say autistic, but, you know, spurgy males into complex worldviews, which is, you know, it's a it's it's an orderly, systematic way of thinking about economic relationships. And I think one of the, the common and one of the good criticisms of libertarianism is always that, you know, libertarianism seeks to free man of all his obligations and encumbrances. And that's, if, if you just stop right there, that's, that's an obviously absurd thing, right? So imagine a world where no one owes anything to anybody that's, that sort of refutes itself. Um, I think where criticisms of libertarianism fall a little flat is uh, the idea is not to free man of all encumbrances. It's to free him from these sort of anonymous encumbrances of an intrusive state or, you know, an overweening democracy and allow him to assert his own value. So I think the thoughtful libertarian says, um, look, there's all, all kinds of areas of my life where I would like to join with my fellow man and build institutions that reflect our values, but we're not able to do that because we don't have freedom of association, freedom of contract. And so I think to give libertarianism a more honest account is, is, to, is to recognize that it's it's not a it's not a normative system. It doesn't it doesn't tell you what's good. It doesn't tell you what's proper. It says that if you have a group of people who share some base values, which is by the way, that's where all the hard work happens, right? And I think that's much more interesting at the end of the day than than talking about any economic system. But if you have a group of people who share values, what is the most efficient way to let them go about asserting those values? And you know, I think where I am in in my journey, if you want to call it that, is I would I would still stand by the the descriptive content of libertarianism, which is to say that if you have economic relationships between people, the most efficient way to organize them is on a negative rights basis with freedom of contract, freedom of association. But to say that is to is to gloss over all the much more interesting and harder discussions about <laughs> who are you, who are these people that that you're seeking to contract with? What are your values? What are you building um, in that economic sandbox? So um, yeah, I think I think some number of years ago, I might've mistaken libertarianism for something that gives all the answers, you know, descriptively and normatively, but um, ultimately, you know, there's no system that gives you the normative answer. You have to do that work yourself. Yeah, I think that, you know, if this is the kind of limited case for libertarianism, I'm probably not too far off from that. I mean, I've, I've grown up in, in Romania, a country was plagued very much by the disease that libertarianism hates so much, you know, an overbearing state and, um, you know, lack of freedom of association, lack of many freedoms. Um, and I can definitely understand the, that kind of limited case for libertarianism. I think uh, the main problem that most people have is just um, the, you know, scaling it up from the, from the napkin model, which I admit is probably one of the most clear and mathematically cogent ones, and it, it, it really does make sense, it rhymes, to a whole world without necessarily taking into consideration the factor, the, the great factor of power, exactly how one would implement this and how one would get just kind of like a, a game theoretic agreement where, you know, the, the NAP isn't just some thing, some agreement between three, three spurgs. Uh, it's actually a, something that you can scale up to the level of a state. Um, that's a bit harder, uh, I think. And I feel like that's why people kind of drifted off into more of a, I mean, you know, a lot of the so-called dissident right 
have different forms of, you know, nationalism, you know, monarchy, monarchism or, or things like that, where the individual liberty of the essentially the individual is is kind of protected by a different kind of superstructure, which is larger, more overbearing, has a lot more power. Um, but you don't, um, one, it, it works. It's kind of almost a natural way in which human groups coalesce at scale. It's, you know, monarchy is not like not untested. People hate it for different reasons, of course, but it's it's been used in the past for, for a good reason. And um, it's also not what we have now, which is just a constant obsessive engagement with politics as entertainment every day. And, um, you know, whatever, you know, form of aborted democracy we're in right now, um, it's obviously not, not ideal. So that's what I say. I mean, I, I understand why people kind of drift that way. I, that was kind of my, my journey as well. So, um, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about any of that? Well, I think there's a, there's a broader, um, point to all of that, that, that applies to a lot of American, uh, and I'm American, applies to a lot of American navel gazing when it comes to political systems, which is if you're fortunate enough to be a member of, you know, the most successful and powerful political system ever, you have the leisure to forget that force exists and that and that it was force that created uh, this sort of, you know, walled garden where everyone can treat each other as interchangeable Legos and, you know, forget that nasty things happen in the world. So, yes, I agree. It's, it's easy for libertarians to forget that at the end of the day, um, someone is going to hold the whip hand if only to, you know, adjudicate contracts, um, police borders, that sorts of thing, those, those sorts of things. Now, of course, there are open borders libertarians, which, you know, that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the idea of a world with, with no force is just, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a bit of a fantasy. Yeah. And, and I think also the kind of the practical victories of, of libertarians and who they've allied themselves with and, and, you know, just in recent history have seemingly always, always just been, you know, grease for the wheels of the left, you know, because the, the only thing that the left will allow you to dissolve are, you know, traditional institutions, you, you know, so obviously, you know, all libertarians obviously prefer gay marriage, you know, but like when it comes to, I don't know, gun rights, they're not as successful. They might, you know, advocate for them as well, but, you know, it doesn't matter. So you you just end up dissolving the things that the left wants dissolved anyway uh, mm-hmm. and completely, <laughs> completely, you know, ignoring the things that are, you know, maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, it's still, you know, like freedom of association. Like that's been very, very hard to maintain. So I, this is why I have this dream that that our champion will emerge and he will be or she will be a um, an HBD libertarian, someone someone who understands the economics can geek out on optimal trade policy and and, you know, economic liberalization and all the rest. But who also understands that people aren't interchangeable Legos and the sorts of values that they want to assert require drawing boundaries and and, you know, having for lack of a better word, prejudices about who's in an in-group, who's in an out-group, you know, norms of behavior. So um, it's it's interesting to watch some of the, I think part of the problem here is that the best place to be an outspoken libertarian um, and and get publicized is the academy, right? It's, it's to be one of these celebrity guys like Brian Kaplan, who can, and I, mean, I love Brian Kaplan, you know, put books out there and go do speaking tours, but it's very hard to be in the academy and push the boundaries too far, you know. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with that. I guess where I'm going is I, I think libertarianism married with a worldview that's a bit more realistic about power, to use your word, and more realistic about human differences could, could start to have very interesting ideas about, you know, how to replace community in, in, in places that no longer have community. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, the, like you mentioned, Brian Kaplan, I mean, a lot of the most interesting people in the world are libertarian or libertarian-ish in terms of the the research that they do or allow themselves to do. And, um, you know, a lot of super generative stuff comes out of the space. Um, you know, I just think the, 
the overarching worldview is is a bit utopian. But at the same time, you know, we're at the stage now where we realize, okay, this is utopian, this is utopian, this is utopian. But what, you know, what exactly can we do within the constraints of reality, within the, you know, what what we have with with essentially technology being its own um force, you know, it's it's not even the press anymore. It's a completely different type of animal that skews everything, skews, you know, the human being itself. There's there's so many factors in there that you can't even even the idea that, oh, you know, we just need a monarchy. Okay. It's probably the most classical thing to do. And it's not like it's never been done before, but just overlay that on top of whatever types of states we have now with, you know, our kind of strange puppet show of democracy. Um you know, lay the internet over that. Like, how exactly is that going to happen? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if there's like a, a a mass movement over Airbnb and all this sovereign individual stuff. It's, you can see the seeds are there for people to do creative things with. I don't know if it will cohere to anything, you know, anything interesting. Um, what was I going to say? There was something you said that jogged my memory. Um, Ah, I've lost my thought. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's a podcast. Have peppers all the time. I've. <laughs> this is essentially kind of the the only skill of the podcast host is to not forget what you were trying to say before the uh-huh. guest ends, but also don't ignore him. Also answer what they're doing. So it's a it's a whole thing. No no worries. <laughs> I, I've got it. What I was what I was going to say, and I think you and I were even going back and forth a bit about this on Twitter earlier this week. Is there's this sort of deflating fact that I think most people realize, but don't talk about because it is deflating, which is that political systems are kind of secondary at the end of the day um, to what the substrate is, like who the people are. And, and, you know, the the sort of extremes of that example is Singapore is probably going to work pretty well, whether it's a monarchy or whether it's a democracy or whether it's libertarian. And, you know, the other end of that spectrum, you know, Ethiopia, if you could, if you could get Brian Kaplan and Richard Hanania and, and, you know, bring back Murray Rothbard from the dead and, and let them just put a perfect political system in place, it probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't go very well. So at the end of the day, these, I'm tempted to think that most political systems are sort of secondary. They're ad hoc explanations that people agree after the fact to sort of, you know, sanctify something that's already happened. And you saw this with, you know, you saw this in the industrial revolution and, and, and the enlightenment. To some degree. It's not that, it's not that people, I mean, take, take the idea of interest. This is a, a super banal example, but take the idea of usury, right? It's not that through long labor, people like realize one day that money lending was okay. It's that money lending was, was opening up new avenues in commerce. So people were doing it. And so then it was the work of the church to spend a, you know, a couple of centuries figuring out how to bless it. And it's hard not to see that pattern in a lot of development where, you know, the world shifts because it's, it's energetically and economically efficient to do that. And then people build the political structures afterwards to sort of bless the whole thing. Yes. I think that's, that's a really good point. And even though it really, like I said, it essentially deflates a lot of philosophical discussion about ideology because people who like ideology and like history and like philosophy, they tend to look at philosophy and say, okay, there's, there's, there's causality here. You know, like the, the whole story about the Frankfurt school cause wokeness. Okay. I, I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not, not, not the first time I've said that that's probably not the case, but um, you know, a, a lot of these movements, a lot of these ideologies, like you said, they, they come into um, to create a backstory, to describe the moment. A lot of them are essentially just noting down what's going on there, you know, the phenomena that are happening. And then people look back in history and say, oh, they were talking about this back then. Well, you know, people living in the 60s, you know, talking about things that were already happening in the 60s, uh, you know, were not causal to what happened in the 60s. I'm sorry to, you know, <laughs> deflate the whole thing. Um yeah, and I think that's that's the case with so many other things, you know, like, you know, feminist feminism is a big, you know, um, you know, bugaboo for for a lot of people, you know, they a lot of people see feminism as causal. Feminism is a hothouse flower. It's it's an yeast overgrowth over a, you know, a situation <laughs> that is 
enabled by technology in abundance. Like under the iron rule of nature, patriarchy exists as a technology. It's not, you know, it's not like you can, you know, we're, we're going to negotiate, you know, who does what. No, <laughs> everyone knows what they do or else we die. That's kind of it. And agriculture as well, extremely strict, extremely, you know, harsh timelines, harsh rules about how to do what. And then, <laughs> the, the, you know, the next step is like, you know, people relax enough to be able to muse about women and men and Simone de Beauvoir, whatever. And then they're like, oh, you know, feminism, you know, just just implanted the evil into the world. The, the evil was already there. It was it was growing. It just needed its own historians and its own muses and its own poets to 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 bless it, like you said. So, yeah, I don't know. It's um, I, that's that's kind of the conclusion I'm reaching slowly just by looking at all of this. It's just like the, the timelines don't match people. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was a revelation for me. I think it's obvious to a lot of other people, but I'm because I'm a nerd. I, I like to read a lot of just random sort of diary accounts from 19th century in in funny places. So guys on the Western frontier in the U.S. or you know, just finished a book on the mining magnates in South Africa. And one of the things that was surprising to me is reading about these you know English guys in let's say I don't know what it was the 1850s in in South Africa. Um, you're already seeing that there was a mode of life that 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 they were living that looks very modern, it, and, and it had elements of of sexual liberation, um, and you just see that this stuff wasn't invented in the '60s, right? It was put in train way way earlier, um, and I think Gregory Clark talks about this, right? When he's got a book where he looks at sort of the the popular explanations for why the Industrial Revolution happened when it did and where it did, and Almost any of the explanations that you care to point to, if you go look at them, you find that social patterns had already started to change before those things, you know, before people, it wasn't coal, you know, people were already doing different th things differently before coal happened. Um, so yeah, this, this pattern crops up everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, defeating if you have kind of a, a philosophical bent and you know that's that's kind of a, a a hobby, but I think it's um it's also illuminating in a way about what's possible and you know how much you can go against the grain of forces that already exist and if you're going to make any predictions about what's going to happen, you better look at at stuff that is emergent and you know that's been around for a while and you know <laughs> I don't expect, you know, revolutionary upheavals um, that are not, um, you know, that don't take into consideration the, the place we're already in. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think, and and none of this should make anyone pessimistic. I mean, the, the, the flip side of this coin is, as you alluded to, there are, you know, new possibilities today that that are going to be sort of congealed in retrospect into, into new narratives um, with probably new political systems. I mean, embryo selection is a fascinating topic that you know gets talked about a lot today, but that's um that's a cause for optimism. I mean we're we're literally building new people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean depends. I just had <laughs> You don't a, sound that optimistic. <laughs> depends. I just I just had a, a a podcast just like I think a, a week ago with uh Jean Jean Francois Garriapi who um he essentially wrote a book on why this is you know, literally the end of humanity. <laughs> oh, and, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's a biologist and he calls it, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the premise for the so-called phenotypic revolution where, we, you know, we move away from sexual selection onto a selection that is driven by something that's not evolutionary necessarily. It's, you know, whatever type of technology, whatever type of incentives people have, um, it's obviously going to be a little bit faulty. So we're essentially moving away from nature. And the result of that is going to, he says, you know, m might lead to, you know, generations of, of actually sterile people and, you know, complete dependence on, you know, outside, um, you know, these, these essentially baby generators, you know, be it exo wombs or, you know, cause obviously embryo selection is just, you know, he sees it as, you know, it's it just one domino, you know, if embryo selection is fine, then you do the next thing. And before embryo selection, you had genetic testing, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever. And then you, you just move along the, the thing and every next step is, is comfortable, you know, because the, the water is heating up by one degree. Um, but the end point of that is a complete detachment of the human species from sexual selection, which is already in, culturally in, in, in move. I mean, look at, you know, 
in the words of uh, in the words of the the incredible Thomas seven seven seven, you know, the 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 younger generation <laughs> just wants to screw the Snorlax Pokemon, and it is true, uh, <laughs> you know, the horniness meter has dropped <laughs> precipitously. You know, we're already in in, in troubled waters. So I don't know. <laughs> that, by the way, it just fascinates me. Like, you know, if if there were a zoo, and this happens, right? In a zoo, when they get the the giant pandas in there, and the pandas refuse to mate. Everyone in the world agrees that that's a problem, right? And, and sort of everything is on the table. People want to talk about what's wrong, what can we change? And it's fascinating that we live in a time currently where, you know, the crudest measure of human thriving, I'm not even claiming it's, it's important, but it's, it's, a, it's the crudest measure of human thriving, you know, fertility, um, is in deficit in most places in the world. Um, but there's a tremendous reluctance to talk about it. It's just, it's just funny. Most, most of the time, people are eager to talk about existential threats to humanity, right? If, if sea level is going to rise an inch in the next 50 years, people want to reinvent the family. They want to dismantle capitalism. They want to go to other planets. It's sort of fair game to talk about anything. But, you know, if, if the, the fundamental ways that people relate to each other are breaking down, People don't want to talk about it. It's, it's very strange. Yeah, I think it, it feels to me like the the target of of the of fear is not necessarily humanity in itself. I feel like humanity is kind of a, a passe concept. It's it's, it's right wing coded. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, but there's you know you know the planet the planet's a better thing you know if the, if the sea levels rise on the planet you know the planet itself is is, is screaming in agony Gaia you know there's it's just a, a different level of abstraction um, and um, you know problems with fertility can be compensated with immigration you know there's there's ways in which the left can you know kind of cover up this this problem it's it's, it's an uncomfortable very right wing problem because mostly western countries have, are having this problem obviously asia is also western coded so you know asia is, is no problem so you know people are still you know having a lot of babies in africa so overall we're fine you know this is essentially what you hear when uh, when you, people kind of uh, try to you know bring this into the the wonk circles you know overall you know enough there's enough humans I know there. I know fertility is still positive everywhere in, or most places in Africa. But aren't they going through the demographic transition? I thought that those fertility curves are sort of following. I thought they're sort of bending the way that you would expect them to bend, given where they are in their sort of industrial journey. Is that not the case? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it is the case, but I don't I don't see anyone, um, you know, being too too stressed out about it. You know, I think a, a lot of the left and you know the left is still very much in power. Is you know still kind of has that you know Paul Ehrlich type uh, overpopulation mm-hmm. bent and yeah it's just it's just not interesting from a left wing perspective to talk about declining fertility in the West of all places. So. Oh man, I've I've mentioned this on Twitter, but my um, my aunt is like buddy buddy with Paul Ehrlich, who apparently still <laughs> maintains a giant email list from whatever universities, and he sends out these weekly blasts. It's just it's bizarre to see what what's on these email lists. Yeah, I mean, he was on Twitter recently saying that he wasn't actually wrong <laughs> with the population bomb. He was just like, "I would the, the science was right," and I'm like, "How was the science right?" <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's like uh, those apocalypse cults, you know, the apocalypse it's gonna come eventually. It's not this Friday, but also not in 20 years. But you know, we're still right. So yeah, it's interesting. What, worse than that, I think the like famously, I don't know if it's it, it might just be a. Uh, it might be a trope, but famously with those those cults, I think I think they say not only were we just not only were we right, it was it was only because of our prayers that it didn't happen. So actually, it, it showed how right we were. So you know, it, yeah, it, I think there it hadn't were been some for the studies. Kyoto Accord. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think I think there were some studies about um, strength of of belief in, in these things. You know, they they interviewed people, obviously still you know self reported, but. Um, you know, members of these apocalypse cults and, you know, did their faith in the, in the cult wane after, you know, the, the sixth missed apocalypse. And they're like, <laughs> nope, still believe in it. It's still great. You know, he, the leader miscalculated just a little bit, but next blue moon, it's going to happen. So, I mean, I, <laughs> it's some sort of Stockholm syndrome, but yeah, I guess well, it, it maybe, was. Maybe that's what the right needs is, is some sort of fantasy like that to bind them together. Yeah, it seems like we can't we can't find any fantasy because we're 
the, the latest round of bickering is about blowjobs and, you know, should you like women? Is it gay? Should you like anime? Is it less gay? I don't know. Is it gay to be gay? I, 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 I'm very confused. I feel like these are not conversations for me and, you know, I should, as a femoid, I should stay out of this. But yeah, it's all about what, what is gay and what's not. That shows you how compressed the news cycle is these days because I was, I was on, I think I was in airports for like 40 hours when that was happening on Twitter. So I've seen the aftermath, but I don't actually know what that was all about. And I, I decided I probably don't need to know. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you could skip this one and be, <laughs> be glad. I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a rehash of the same, um, you know, kind of pirate vitalism versus wife guys battle you know uh, it's gay to have a wife because she's rep- is a representative of the, the long house in your house like you're obviously been you know you're under the whip hand so i don't know you know i'm a wife so i'm pro- <laughs> you know i can't be impartial here i mean i'm i'm pro wife guy because you know this just happens but um yeah i don't know it's it's interesting as as all the conversations in our circles are but yeah it's 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 never ending i don't think it's gonna conclude anytime soon Funny. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a dad, so I'm also pro. I'm pro dad. So we're on the same page. <laughs> That's good. Finally, some someone in my small tribe, you know. <laughs> um, um, let's see. I also I am. You know, you're you're associate. As you said, you're American, but you're associated with South Africa. I guess you you live there. You you know stuff about South Africa. I don't want to reveal anything about your association, whatever it is with South Africa. But you know a lot about about the country, um, and it is. Interestingly, um, it's kind of a precocious place. <laughs> a lot of people say that, you know, we're, we're kind of the destiny of especially a country like America, it's probably either South Africa or Brazil, depending on, you know, how much, um, I guess, right wing energy is in the, in the government. And you know, there's just kind of regional flavors to it. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, what, what is your impression of, of, of how things have gone, especially in the last five years, because things have precipitated quite, quite fast there. I mean, it, five years ago, it was, it seemed at least from the outside looking in that it was quite peaceful. I mean, you didn't hear about, you know, mass lootings, burnings, this and that, you know, constant things, uh, you know, farm murders and all the horrible stuff that we found out about recently. But I mean, what's, what's the evolution been like? Well, the, the, um, the, the quip that I saw somewhere, I, I forget who it was, but it was terrific. You know, they say if, if Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires, South Africa is the laboratory of empires. And it's, it was just perfectly put because, um, you know, I think Americans get used to thinking that they're at the vanguard of all adventurous social policy, right? This is the land of progressivism and we're leading the charge. But a lot of our adventurous social policies, it's old. It's, it's been around in places like India and South Africa for for, you know, oftentimes decades. Uh, and so you can, Americans could, if they wanted, go look at how these policies play out elsewhere. Um, I don't actually know all that much about South Africa. I didn't, I didn't grow up there. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, a cultural tourist, but maybe being a foreigner makes me able to see things. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what to say. It's, it's, uh, is it getting worse? It, the public infrastructure is getting worse. Does it does it get worse linearly? And uh, is there some is there some nonlinear thing that happens at some point that leads to you know catastrophic failure? I think that's what everyone gets scared about. And last year there was the or was it 2021. I think it was July 2021. You had all the the rioting. Um, it's scary. Yeah, I um, it's, I'm not sure what to add. It, it is frightening. Um, What's interesting to me about South Africa, though, is, and I, I don't know what the reasons are historically, but there is such a failure of the state that it actually gives a bit of free reign in in areas that are outside the gaze of the state to tinker with with other white ways of organizing life and seeing to daily needs. And it's it's just interesting to live somewhere where you know a middle class family can have private police. And of course, that's not a good thing, right? That reflects poorly on, on the country. But it's, it's interesting to see people building up a parallel private sector uh, to provide daily needs. And, and that's how South Africa works. Like you, pay, you pay the government a lot to provide services that they don't provide you. And then you actually need those services. So you, have, you go contract 
on the private market to, to get them again. Um, so it's an interesting little laboratory for uh, all kinds of little, I don't know, experiments. But yeah, it's it's a depressing place. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, at the at the fringes um, where 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 the interesting stuff happens, just because of necessity. I mean, where where need strikes uh, opportunity. Um, I mean, what you what you're talking about is it's it's pretty much the case here in Romania as well. I mean, we also you know pay exorbitant taxes to the government. Who to, we have, you know, obviously an equivalent of the NHS. It's all a lot of socialized stuff, absolutely unusable. It's kind of just the last resort for people, and you can get some pres- some more exotic prescription medication through that. But most people go to private sector stuff, and you know we do, we're not definitely not a private police level because we don't need private police because you know we've we've been emptied out. You know, there's not that many criminals left in Romania. <laughs> They've all moved to to greener pastures. You know, Western <laughs> Europe's right next door. So um, you know that's that's a problem that solved solved itself quite quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, every kind of, I mean, Romania is not a failed state, but it's a, it's a struggling state and essentially taxes here are also kind of a a protection racket though uh, local taxes. I'm happy to pay because it, you know, just, it happens here that we, we locally have a really good mayor and the people around, you know, city hall and stuff actually do stuff, you know, they're you know, new buildings, new parks, new roads, new overpasses. Like, you know, what's, what is this? It's incredible. So yeah, I'm I'm really happy to pay my local taxes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, one of the more clear examples of uh, of an experiment in, in South Africa is, uh, is Irania. I know you've written about that recently, and um, I mean, from the outside looking in, it's like, they, who let them do that? <laughs> yeah, I, again, it's 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 surprising that a country with so much you know class and racial strife. Um, and such a kleptocratic government has allowed, you know, frankly, a somewhat libertarian experiment to happen. It's not, it's not really libertarian, but it's, it's in that direction. Like that wouldn't, that would be hard to do in the U.S. I don't think it would be possible. No, I, I mean, I also saw people, obviously, you know, South Africans who weren't um, from Irania complaining that, you know, it shouldn't be allowed. You know, people obviously more associated with of American culture and, you know, kind of downstream of that. Um, it shouldn't be allowed, you know, advocating for it to be, I don't know, shut down, torn down, integrated, whatever. Uh, but I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone's minds, I don't know. I feel like uh, one, of, one of the comments to your thread was that you, they, they actually do pay state taxes, but they're, they're kind of on by, by themselves municipally. They kind of can organize themselves. I feel like, you know, paying a protection tax just for, so the state can, can leave your whole city alone. That's, I am pretty much ideal. <laughs> Happy to pay, you know, uh, 10% to, to the Caesar, you know, give, give upon Caesar what is Caesar's and, you know, just leave Caesar, leave me alone. And then, yeah, I mean, if, if that's libertarianism, I'm in. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't see that working. So uh, some days I think libertarian, like to the extent that it has content, the content is just smaller government. Like this, this government doesn't represent me. I would like, me and my friends would like to form a smaller association elsewhere. And that's, you know, that's, that's not even libertarianism. That's just saying I would like to be part of a different political order. And that seems to be what they're doing there. I don't, I don't actually know what the man on the street thinks of that um, in, in South Africa. I mean, one of the, one of the things that continually surprised me in SA, just, just talking to average people, you know, black, Indian, white, um, they're so fed up with, with the ANC that they're sort of happy for anything to happen. You know, you'll meet, you'll meet plenty of, plenty of blacks and Indians who, you know, say, Hey, Ronnie is great. Good for them. But not for us, but wish them luck. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I think it's, it's easy to get excited by a little experiment like this when it's, when it's little, right? I think it's, it's pretty easy to make a society run when it's, when it's a couple thousand people and, you know, you all pray together in the same church. You, you sort of, you haven't even faced a difficult problem yet. So we'll see, we'll see if they keep growing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's a, it's a good example of, of what's possible and maybe that's potentially one of the, the better kind of levels of, of population clustering that we can aim for because I mean obviously you know big cities have many advantages and I don't think big cities will disappear anytime soon but as kind of a secondary form of of organization 
you know, the, the, I don't know, three to 10,000 person town is also something because yeah, there, there's something about smallness that's, that really is just, I don't know, manageable and you can have a sort of homogeneity and coordination in, in these little groups of people even even though 10,000 people is not little, but, you know, there can be an overarching theme to these places. And um, I think, you know, Balaji uh, Srinivasan had a, you know, he has this book, you know, The the, the Network Stake. I don't know if you've read it, but um, like I also just kind of browse the, the, the main topics. But I think, you know, he offers an interesting alternative because, you know, the essentially this, these would be kind of a decentralized state where you can kind of just sign up to be governed by X, um, you know, uh, jurisdiction, and you're mm-hmm. you're a member of that state, and then exactly, I didn't go into the details about you know enforcement of all of this, but you know, sounds sounds good. I think you know all these experiments could lead to something interesting and productive in future. Yeah, look in 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 a hand wavy way, it's 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 very compelling. I don't I don't know if it if it will work eventually, but there are parallels in in the private market, right? Like. Companies that don't want to be beholden to the, the slow and cumbersome court system will contract with each other to be bound to arbitration, and and the market for arbitration is you know private arbitral bodies can say we agree that if we have a dispute we're gonna we're gonna be subject to this arbitral body or that arbitral body. So there's there's parallels for all this stuff. I don't know if you can recreate a whole society that way. I I haven't read his book, so I don't know what the full proposal looks like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've trying to um, get him on the show as well to kind of uh, elaborate on that because I've, I've chatted to him and he might, he might come on. We'll see. Um, and I think, I think it, it is interesting and he's obviously a very thoughtful person. So he's probably, you know, troubleshooted a lot of the, my objections. So I'd like to see how he does that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, more power to, to anyone doing, uh, you know, there's a praxis as well. They're trying to set up um, kind of a, city state um uh, what are they, charter cities i think yeah that's that's what these experiments are called but yeah i think it's you know very uh, very good um an- another topic that you've talked about is is covid um you famously <laughs> internet famously were a covid denialist you said that it's <laughs> not a big deal are you eating your words are you re- regretful to say that covid the plague that that consumed the world for three whole years is not a big deal. Um, yeah, I mean that would be obviously be flippant to say it's not a big deal, but I think in a in a non-networked age where this had rolled through the world and people didn't have Twitter and Facebook, this this would have been remembered as a nasty flu year. You know, um, there's. Wonderful picture of people at 19, was it 1968 or 69 at Woodstock? Like they were doing all that during the 1968, the Hong Kong flu, which age adjusted and population adjusted, killed millions of people. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I am still firmly in the not a big deal. Um, I think, you know, an analogy I used once, which is like, you know, imagine if a uh, husband wakes his wife up and says, honey, I think there's a raccoon in the attic. We should burn the house down. And she says, that's stupid. It's just a raccoon. Don't do it. And he burns the house down and there was two raccoons in there. It's like, okay, it was worse than you thought in the beginning, but still shutting the world down before it was, was idiotic. Like, yeah, in, in early 2020, I, I got it really wrong. I, I was looking at the way the, the Chinese and Korean data was going. Ah, oh, this probably isn't even going to be a big deal in the West. It's probably going to you know, kill 10,000 people globally. And that was wrong by, you know, a factor of a couple of hundred. But yeah, in the, in the grand scheme of things, I think it's an uh, absolute travesty to have shut the world down for. Yeah. I mean, also, you know, if you look at excess mortality and just just overall, it really doesn't, you know, just from the, from the highest of, of vantage points, it doesn't look good. And I also, I think you made a point somewhere about, kind of the the value of of anecdotes on COVID because what we got with COVID is, you know, a flood of data. You know, everyone had their own data, you know, their own graphs, you know, the 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 hammer and the dents and every everybody was like throwing stuff in stuff in your face to convince you of their position of, you know, we the, you know, things are bad, therefore lockdown, death tolls, whatever. Um and, you know, 
the, the reality is, and this is kind of something I draw inspiration on for this podcast and in general, that, you know, the lying eyes school of, of, you know, experiential knowledge is very valuable and people discount it in the age of data, um, especially, you know, looking around, okay, you know, what the severity of COVID, you know, you can see that most people got COVID. Most people that I know eventually got COVID. You see kind of what the severity is, what happened. Um, most people that I know that got vaccinated. You can also see, you know, within a certain time frame, what happens after that. And a lot of people, you know, drew different conclusions from that, which were very much against the data. Um, you know, a lot of people said, you know, COVID is is mild and the vaccine is not as mild as they're saying. I'm not saying that it's, you know, terrible, but there are unintended consequences from that. And this is all from anecdotal evidence, just, you know, lying eye school of of research. Um, but I, I don't know, what, what do you, um, what do you think about, you know, just drawing conclusions from what you see? I, I'll come back to that specific question, but I want to actually draw a parallel to the libertarianism earlier, which is um, one of the things that made me become a little bit solution with libertarianism is, you know, in, in a, in a fully libertarian world, COVID is the perfect, it's, it's the perfect nail to be hit with a libertarian hammer for the following reason. Um, if, if you believe that a respiratory virus burns through a population and people are immune once they recover from it, which is, is more or less the case, right? You've, you've got long lasting resistance, not immunity per se, but resistance. Um, then everyone should be able to get exactly the experience they want from COVID using personal choice. The people who are scared of it, can stay inside, they can lock themselves down, they can let all the rambunctious idiots go out and get infected, and then it dies out, and then everyone can come out of their houses who are in their houses. Anyone who wants to take the risk can go outside and get COVID. So um, it was it was just hallucinatory for me to be watching the discourse on lockdowns um, and, and see that no one was talking about the fact that you don't actually need a law about it. You can just tell the people that are scared of COVID, hey, you can stay in your home. We don't need to lock everyone down. Like it's doing you a big favor to let the young people go out and get infected because they will be the firebreak that protects you a year from now. Um, so it was it was an eye opening real life experience for me to see that people can have the best intentions about personal liberty and responsibility and personal choice in a situation where you can fully protect yourself by deciding to stay indoors. And yet that wasn't enough for people. They wanted they wanted the state to come in and, and mandate behavior. Um, but to your specific point about Sort of extrapolated from personal anecdote. Is this the um, that was the question? Yeah, it was funny. I mean, we've all lived through two waves of it. I remember during during COVID itself, um, I have family members who were sort of adjacent to various parts of the medical system, and you know, I would be getting WhatsApp messages with these lurid stories that were ambiguously attributed to some doctor, and it was never clear if they were true. And it was about you know who died yesterday and who died today, and and it was. It was just wild to see people extrapolating wrongly from their personal experience, right? It was it was the first time most people had ever paid attention to who was dying in their social network at two and three and four degrees of separation, right? And obviously, if you do that in a given year, a lot of people die three degrees of separation from you. So that was, you know, I, I rolled my eyes at that, of course. And then now the same thing is happening with vaccines. Um, and look, the, the, the vax may be net beneficial or that harmful for different demographics, but um, now it's the same thing where, where people are paying minute attention to who on Facebook that's three degrees of separation away from them, you know, got myocarditis and drawing conclusions from it. So it's, yeah, it's two waves of, of, of inappropriate extrapolation from anecdotes. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you, you get a, whatever, a Volkswagen car and everyone's driving a Volkswagen, you're just kind of primed to, to notice everything. And uh, yeah, and then, yeah, all these anecdotes come to fill your coffers. And, you know, obviously, if you're inclined to believe this or that, you know, you're probably going to notice things uh, that fit your uh, pr previous uh, conviction. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, I've, uh, in, in my case, I was, um, I just kind of saw the case of, of my mom because she, she died following whatever happened during the COVID epidemic, which might include COVID itself, but it looked like she had a, a vaccine injury because she started having like, you know, extreme um, arthritis 
um, after, a, I don't know, maybe a week after the third dose of, of Moderna. Um, and then she got put on some some extremely heavy kind of, um, you know, essentially cancer meds to uh, counteract that. And the cancer meds seemed to have led oh. to, to her death. So, yeah, it, it was just kind of, you know, one of those things that just happened in quick succession. And it just, you know... Maybe, maybe also aligned with my priors, but it just it just feels like this this whole, you know, the, these last few years have just been one unclear nightmare over an, another. And yeah, I, I just I, I personally just don't know what to think because well, you know, it, yeah. The the uplifting part of it for me is like it it really dragged the academic establishments out into the sunlight <laughs> and and made people look at them. And, in a way that I think is exciting. Like, I, th- I think I was fairly cynical about the quality of, of a lot of, you know, peer review science coming into COVID, but I had really no idea how bad it was. That's, that's a lesson that I'm going to take forward into the rest of my life, you know, knowing, knowing what gets put in, in the Lancet or in nature and understanding the ways that, you know, hopelessly confounded observational studies can get called, you know, a randomized experiment when they're not by the, the highest health authorities in the land. It was just, um, I, okay, everyone said the same thing, right? It, it, it showed where the rot was in many of our institutions. And as frustrating as that is in the present, it's, um, I, I think it, it, it shows some paths forward, right? It, it shows you which parts of academia are not really, are not really doing anything useful. It shows you which parts of public health are not doing anything useful. So I'm, I'm long-term optimistic about all of this stuff to the extent that it accelerates the erosion of those sort of vestigial institutions. Yeah. I feel like, you know, there's always a risk of kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I mean, there is quite a lot of usefulness to, um, you know, a, a lot of the institutions that have been built around, but there, there is, yeah, a, a lot of dead wood that just has no mechanism to be cleared out. You know, there's no, there's no market mechanism in any of these, you know, there's no incentives to actually, um, you know, oust this or that, you know, there's kind of a bit of an omerta, you know, around doctors and stuff like that. It's, you know, no one wants to get, you know, sued. So it, it, it makes sense that, you know, the, the deadwood had collected and the brush fire of, of visibility kind of uh, hopefully removed some of it, but it also seems like it entrenched it in some, in some of the institutions. Um, so we'll, we'll have to yeah, see. I we- think, yeah. I would imagine the public sector stuff, I mean, public sector stuff is always its own constituent and it only gets bigger and bigger, right? That's, that's the way it goes. So yes, I'm, I'm afraid of what the CDC will metastasize into and you can already see which way it's going. It's, you know, it considers, you know, social justice and climate change to be um, part of its remit now, which is, which is crazy. But I think there is a market mechanism in a lot of the institutions, you know, you see, uh, I'm pretty sure college enrollment is down. Um, you know, you look at professional bodies like the AMA uh, down. Um, you look at subscription levels for any of these, you know, August publications down. Uh, so I, I think there is some feedback mechanism. And then, you know, there's the, <laughs> the hyper online sphere that you and I in, inhabit where we see what's replacing it, right? You've got, you've got guys like, you know, Emil Kierkegaard doing, you know, lit reviews on his own time and just shredding experts in in various fields who who should who should know better and it's it's beautiful to watch yeah yeah it is and how much you know people like emil can get done with like very limited data sets because he's can't we can't really use you know his own data i mean what's he going to do like run you know nationwide iq test (laughs) situations no he has to rely on other people's data but he's He's quite sneaky. I love it. He's just kind of trawling the internet for, you know, any sort of data set that's um, even, you know, remotely and having a close look at it. And yeah, you know, they're doing God's work. I love, I, I honestly get, I probably get more out of his non-intelligent stuff. Like he, he does this thing frequently where he'll be interested in some topic in some random field. And he'll say, okay, let's go look at what the data says. And he'll find a dozen papers on it and sort of do a blog post that steps through in very non-technical language, like, okay, here are the methods, here are the claims, let's look at the results. And honestly, I think if you were doing like a stats 101 course in college, you should just take like 15 Emil Kierkegaard lit reviews. <laughs> and and that would be the course. It's, it's a great resource. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's providing a a very good service for you know the, the few few people who are interested in this type of stuff. I think more and more people are interested in, in this type. It's just you know you can't really keep a lid on on heterodox uh, curiosity for for very long, especially if it really flies in the face of reality. Um, yep. But yeah, I think it's uh, it's he's doing he's doing his best. Um, I think there's there's an, another thing that I want to ask you about is the uh, the Tesla deaths. <laughs> this is something you think no. <laughs> um, I mean, are you are you just like shorting Tesla and trying to ruin the man's reputation and his product? And you know what what exactly are you attempting to do with your with your I don't know the database of people tying in Tesla? <laughs> uh, so no, I'm I'm not uh, financially involved one way or the other with betting for against Tesla. Um, Let's see how can I how can I make this a short story? So I work in capital markets, so you know finance stuff is, is my job. Um, and I had followed various Musk entities for years. And um, in 2016, I didn't really understand what Twitter was, but I was um, I made an account to do some light trolling of of, uh, of Musk and, and some of his entities because my view then and view now is a lot of the Musk mythology. If you peel it back. Turns out to be basically empty. Like the the basic claims about the achievement, the technological achievements that, that Tesla and SpaceX X, just if you examine them at a very basic level, they turn out not to be true. Um, and this was back in 2016. Sort of early versions of autopilot for Tesla was, was much in the news. Right, they had a partnership with Mobileye, and they were breaking ground in automated driving. Um, and I would just notice in the news that there were a lot of Tesla deaths uh, that just didn't get reported in the sort of, um, you know, guys on, I think it was Morgan Stanley kept a list of, of Tesla deaths and they were just missing a lot of local deaths in Tesla cars. So um, me and a few other rando anonymous guys on Twitter put a website up just to do a crowdsource tracking thing. Um, you know, every time someone dies in a Tesla, add it to the list. Uh, to sort of highlight that this, you know, this so-called autopilot that he was selling at the time was was not in fact autopilot. It was basically a, a glorified level two lane keeping assist technology. Um, so yeah, made the site and it sort of took on a life of its own. Um, I actually no longer am involved in it. Sometime in 2020, I had a ton of stuff on my plate, so I handed it over full time uh, to the guy I was doing it with. Um, but yeah, it's out there. It's a resource. Uh, I see from time to time it gets it's like referenced in lawsuits. It's uh, they get they get sued a lot for autopilot. I think the, there's an announcement today or yesterday that the DOJ has been requesting records from them um, regarding autopilot. So we'll see what happens. I, I expect it'll get taken off the market at some point, but uh, you know, regulators are always slow with these things. Hmm. That is interesting. And uh, are these deaths somehow provably related to, to autopilot, just people dying in Teslas? That's it. Oh. Um, it's the the website is a, is meant to be a comprehensive record of anyone who's ever died in a Tesla for any reason. Um, autopilot deaths are tricky to get a beat on. Sometimes you have confirmation because in a crash investigation, the NTSB or the DF, whoever the authority is will like get the crash logs and, and confirm that autopilot was on. Um, but one of the funny little quirks of autopilot is it will it will often disengage in like the split second before a crash. Like it's designed to do that, which is a good thing, right? Like if, if the car senses that it's it's going off the rails, so to speak, you want the driver to re-engage. So there's been this funny thing where in a lot of cases, Tesla has honestly but disingenuously been able to say that Tesla was not on autopilot at the time of impact, but it was, you know, it was clearly on, you know, in the two seconds leading up to the crash. So uh, no one really knows what the full number of autopilot deaths is. Um, from the from the ones that have been confirmed, you can you can do some fun math on on probable miles driven and whether these cars are actually safer than you know, the, the average luxury sedan. And I think the answer is probably not, but that'll that'll be yeah. a that'll be a task for the investigators. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, people do tend to say uh, Elon Musk has some sort of kind of infallible guy. Um, yeah. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of uh, the potential <laughs> problem with Tesla. Not that I'm in the market for anything like that, but it's, uh, it's interesting to, to, you know, to add this to the, the catalog of things that you know might be interesting about Elon Musk because there are many. Um, Look, he's, so, he's, I, he's, I, I, I put him. I don't want to say I put him in my good books, but he, 
he showed spine during he showed some amount of backbone during during COVID, and I think I think that was terrific. And he's you know he's been putting a thumb in the eye of a lot of obnoxious sort of woke scolds lately, and I think that's all healthy and for the good. And you know whether he does it for the purest of motivations or because it's you know expedient for him in some way, I, I don't really care. It's, it's great that he's doing it, and uh, <laughs> and I'm glad that he owns Twitter. I think it's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Though I don't, I really don't know what's going on with uh, with engagement. I've been, I have, I've had my my profile locked for the last few days, and my engagement is like up quite a lot. I, you know, I I had a pause in posting, and then I came back, and then I was like, I mean, probably maybe some of my tweets are shitty. That could also be the case, but <laughs> I was just getting, I don't know, just like an insanely low number of views in the first place, and then like I don't know, fifteen likes on on a banger. So I was like, what the hell's going on here? So uh, I had to, I had to lock down and surprisingly it's just going, it's going pretty well. I don't I don't know what's going on. So, you know, maybe, you know, uh, running the place on like a, you know, a 15, um, you know, over caffeinated autists has its pitfalls and you know, maybe some, some stuff gets uh, left by the wayside. Maybe there is, you know, I, I don't think people have been able to clear all the, the back end throttling and all this type of stuff. I mean, I've worked in tech companies. I know what the backend for use for users looks like. Not not at Twitter specifically, but you can essentially load a profile with 15 million tags and 15 million, you know, conditions. And, you know, if if someone maybe like two years ago noticed that I was being a bitch or something like that, but just maybe <laughs> put a tag on me and now whatever the the algorithm sees me as someone who you know, needs to be, you know, reduce visibility or whatever <laughs> internal lingo they have. So who knows exactly what's happening? I don't know. It's be like if, if you ever get a genie in a, in a magic bottle, you know, you ask it to tell you when you're going to die, where you're going to die, <laughs> and you ask it to tell you what Twitter tags are on your account. <laughs> exactly. What does, show me the back end of my Twitter user account. I need to see this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who who knows what's going on? It, it does. It is a it is a strange time. But yeah, overall, I'm I'm happy. Elon Elon owns Twitter. I'm happy for all the the friends and and I mean, some some people are a little bit out there who came back. But you know, more power to them. Let let them be back. You know, let's be libertarian about this. Um, you also had a I think a, an interesting tweet about like kind of uh, AI doomerism. Um, you know, there were. Uh, I think, you know, someone just said, I, no one really believes that AI is going to be an existential threat in the next five to 10 years, you know, and, and you agreed <laughs> that it, it wouldn't. I feel, I feel like, you know, that's, um, you know, I was, it, yeah, I was, I was totally ship post, ship posting for the sake of ship posting. Uh, and, and, and I shouldn't have, I, I, I don't have the technical chops to apply. I, I have no idea. Um, I just then this is a bad part of my personality, but the um the sort of over serious arch rationalist EA community is just is so delightful to troll that I I can't I can't avoid trolling them sometimes. So um yeah, I don't I don't actually think it's a fair criticism to say that, you know, if if, if these guys really feared AI was gonna end the world in the next five years, they'd be out, you know, blowing up server farms. I don't I don't think that's a fair criticism. Just a yeah, but it's fun, troll. isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, building a house in Malibu if you're really concerned about climate change. I mean, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's it's the same. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I also don't have any sort of technical ability to to gauge it. I just have, you know, my female intuition and the fact that, you know, yeah, you know, I I don't I don't like the group where this this um knowledge is emerging from. I don't necessarily trust their priors, their intuition. So I think, you know, I can just dismiss it out of hand. Ah, why not? <laughs> but yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure there are a very clear technical explanation for why the, you know, the singularity is near and we should, you know, you know cover ourselves in, in bed sheets and head to the nearest, uh, you know, cemetery. But yeah, I hope, I hope, uh, I hope those uh, explanations are wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's just me hoping. I'm, I'm not certain about this at all. Um, let's see. I think, I think that was pretty much it. I also wrote down one of your tweets about you dating two engineers, uh, two female engineers, <laughs> I guess. Go um, for it. <laughs> um uh, incidentally, both of them irrepressibly happy girls. 
For both of them, it was natu- the natural uh, and socially approved next step as a diligent, popular head girl type. Um, but they spent a lot of time sobbing after work. <laughs> and I just wrote this down because I feel like, um, you know, this is kind of an archetype. And, um, you know, I, I know the type of woman. I don't know many like female engineers, but I know a few women who kind of went into the technical fields like, you know, civil engineering and, you know, computer programming and stuff like that. And they all kind of have one thing in common. They have kind of this chip on their shoulder a little bit where it's like, it's kind of a thing to prove. It's not necessarily, um, you know, a certain, these people were not like passionate in high school were writing code, you know, designing games and stuff like that. They just kind of wanted to do the thing where, you know, this is what's coming up. There's power, there's status and doing this type of thing. And um, yeah, I thought that, you know, it's, um, yeah, you kind of highlighted an, an archetype in, in that tweet. Yeah, I mean, I when when I think about this, this in my own head, I think of you know you know the phrase mug, <clears throat> "mugged by reality." Like you know, it's sort of a truism of getting older. You, you get mugged by reality in different ways. Like one one way that I was mugged by reality was was moving to Africa, but um, another big mugging by reality has just been you know it was just a couple of years ago, but getting into my mid thirties at the time, um, in the company of, of female friends who were incredibly, you know, impressive, broad-minded, wonderful people and watching them collide with the realities of what it means to be a, you know, a girl boss career turbo in the typical mold and, and, and just watching, watching those careers fly into a million pieces and, and leave a lot of devastation. And, um, it's been eye-opening and and saddening and kind of makes me <laughs> kind of angry too to see this happen to very good people. Um, and yeah, those you know the, the example of the two engineers, those were just two of two of many examples. And um, it's something I I spend a lot of time thinking about, especially as the father of a daughter. Who you know I want to I want to push her to be her best and and you know compete against other people and, and <laughs> be successful and. And yet somehow I also want her to avoid the sort of, you know, siren song of, of empty careerism. Yeah, it, it, it is a, a tough thing to, to kind of work around because the, the, the flip side to this is that there really is no status attached to being, you know, a mother, a stay-at-home mother. You know, it's, it's all kind of a service function that you can just outsource to whoever nannies and daycare and whatever. Um, it's seen as like an imposition on your life and something that's, you know, just hobbles you on your way to become, you know, something that's actually high status, you know, like, you know, a software engineer or whatever. Um, And I can see why women gravitate towards this, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of men as well, you know, they talk, they say, oh, you know, I I, I like the, you know, I I want to stay at home mother and, you know, this this idealized, you know, weed field existence and it's, you know, everything, it's it's all desirable. But in reality, you know, living on a single income is tough. Um, And you know, there's, there's also the thing that like a, a lot of men also think like, okay, she's not bringing in any money. You know, this is like a, you know, we're, we're not equals in this. I'm, I have the upper hand. You're just sitting at home, you know, twiddling your thumbs and whatever, taking care of, you know, cleaning, taking care of kid, children, you know, low status stuff. So I also understand why women would be like, you know, I need to take care of number one and, and, you know, go after status first. And then we'll see about the other, you know, maybe things that I might desire, but are, are, are less of lesser importance because, pretty much everything around me, my whole life has been screaming at me that, you know, this is high status, this is low status. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, you know, I, it's, it's a it's terrible state of fact, but also I can kind of understand why people do it. Yeah. It's, I don't, I don't think the answer is just to go backwards in time in society. I don't think you can put the toothpaste back in the tube and go back to the thick social structures that, you know, sanctified the family and, provided pressure on both man and woman to, to do it right. And, and it's, yeah, the way forward is not back, but I don't know what the way forward is. It's, it's, it's a big question. Um, one of the things that's been interesting to me, just getting on in late thirties now is you're right. If, you know, culturally at large, um, motherhood is not accorded much status. That's definitely true. Um, I've just, as I've gotten older and started to sort of 
circulate in, in different social circles, which are now much more family oriented, you know, older friends who have, who have kids now, um, there absolutely is such a thing as the very high status wife who is high status in large part because of the family that she's put together and maintained. And it's just, it's just a striking thing that I've never really noticed until the last few years, but there are times when, when I'll walk into a home and it is just, I mean, it is very clear that I'm in the presence of a matron and this is her kingdom and it's, there is real status there. Um, so I think, I think some of that gets forgotten, um, because we don't spend any time sanctifying family, right? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's too bad. Yeah. I also think, you know, it's, it's, um, easier to, uh, relate to outside, just to source of status that are outside the family, just because the family is shrunk down quite a lot. You know, a lot of the women who had power in you know, kind of the matriarch crone types, where they had power in kind of these these loose associations between extended family and maybe groups of families in a, in a smaller community, you know, they actually kind of wielded this, you know, sometimes gossipy, sometimes maybe malevolent power of, you know, moving people around and stuff like that. But it, just, it was kind of an, an important function um, to to be keeping the norms of the of the group. But now essentially, you know, what group? You know, yep. you, your friends are lunch friends. You meet them for lunch every two months. That's about it. It's grim. Yeah. And, and there's the, and there's the, look, there's the corresponding thing uh, for men as well, which you know, many people have commented endlessly on, like there are, you know, fewer male coded spaces and there's less sphere in life for most men to sort of be a man. And it's, it's, it's this, the same thing that women suffer, but in, in different ways. And it's, you know, it's what happens when you atomize people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, it's just, you know, in the household as well, you know, because one of the conversations going on now is like about masculinity and, you know, is it is it masculine to be care taking care of, of children and, you know, to be very involved in, in child care? Um, I don't know if it's masculine, but it's just like, you know, given that what, what the family looks like now, you know, you have a household, there are certain tasks to be performed in the household, um, you know, one of them is not chopping wood for most people, you know, repairing things is left to professionals, um, fending off intruders. I guess you have the police <laughs> if you're not in South Africa, you know, you, there's, there are things, the, 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 the core elements of, you know, of masculinity really are kind of been left on the, on the outside. The fact that men have managed through, you know, the wonderful powers of their, their intellect and cooperation to build a world that it has abundance and comfort at every, you know, running water, in turn, you know, heating, all the cool stuff that we like has banished in a way, a lot of the core masculine things that were, you know, that, that men used to do for, for their household. So the idea that now, you know, women should do the female things and men should do the male things. Like, you know, outside of like playing Call of Duty and changing the light bulbs, what exactly are you going to do? Yeah, um, I mean, we, we still have killing spiders. That's about it. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, I agree in part with that. Obviously, you know, there, we don't get to chop wood anymore. We don't, we don't get to drive the plow and all that. And, and that leaves something missing for sure. On the other hand, I think anyone who's had, any man who's had a child I think would probably agree that, um, you know, the deeper essence of manhood is sort of patience and quiet strength and, you know, pushing the ego down when it needs to be pushed down. And there's, I don't know, I've never felt for a second that, look, maybe I'm a cucked beta, but I've never felt for a second that being a father is, is anything other than masculine. Um, so it, it, it saddens me when I hear dad say that. Like what? How are how are you spending your time with your kids such that you don't feel as masculine? It's it's incredibly masculine. I mean, you are you are sort of ending the narcissism of youth and and putting someone else first. That's that's a very masculine thing to do. Um, yeah. And you know, you, you see this with um, not to not to harp on lesbians, but like you see this when lesbians try to convince themselves that they're men by adopting the characters of masculinity, right? Like. Oh, I'm, I'm going to speak assertively. I'm going to interrupt people. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to do butch things. It doesn't fool anyone, right? Because oftentimes the essence of manhood is, is to not do that stuff. It's not appropriate. So I don't know. I, I hope, I hope no fathers out there think that it's not masculine to be a dad because it seems, <laughs> seems like completely 
completely backwards. Yeah, I think, you know, in, I guess, in the context of our evolutionary history, I can imagine more masculine things, I guess, war, conquest, I don't know, fistfights. I'm sure that there are situations in which you can get into those if, you, if you're so inclined. Uh, but just given the, the realities of, of, of how our life is structured nowadays um, and what it takes to, you know, to bring a child into the world and to, to make it grow up and to make it maybe have a, a good value system and to have someone that it, it can look up to because, you know, the relationship with the mom is one, but, um, you know, if, if the dad kind of projects a certain, a different type of authority in the house that, you know, it, it is necessary. It's like, you know, there's, there's a reason why children of single mothers, you know, raised fairly on the street don't end up really well. I mean, obviously some, some genetic confounding there, but uh, outside of that, you know, there's, there are some, some factors that, um, that, you know, are, are not positive influences in, in, in children's lives. So I don't know. It's, you know, I'm not a man. I, I don't know what it would feel to feel like to, you know, to have the, the howling void of, of missed adventure or whatever it is that that's missing in, in life. And, um, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's yeah. It strikes me as a bit of a limited perspective. Ouch! The say that again. The howling, the howling void of misadventure. That's yeah. uh, that's cutting. <laughs> I, it, to me, that seems like that's that's kind of what it is. You know, it's like you know, you're yeah. just you know. I think you know. I think Mary Harrington says it best. You know, it's like a lot of men says, oh, you know, they're cucked. They're cucked by the longhouse. They're cucked by women. You know, overbearing mammies. You know, just like sucking the life out of everything. But we're we're all cucked by technology. Like just the, the the state of affairs that we're in is emergent from all of the wonderful. Like I said, technology is birthed by mostly men, um, and that we we so love and you know that offer us the comforts. The the warm embrace of the longhouse is essentially a technological feature uh, and a bug. So I don't know. Just Kaczynski, I guess that's that's the solution for this type of stuff. <laughs> but outside of that, you know, you could just yell at women all day it's not really going to make any any change yeah i mean also i think there's like it's like the thing like if a, if a woman has to insist on her chastity she doesn't have it right if, if a man has to insist he's a man he's also not a man like no one's going to make you a man right you're you don't your wife doesn't give you permission to be a man that's not the reason you're not a man but you are you aren't i don't know but I'm impressed that you managed to connect it to Kaczynski. I didn't think we were going to go there on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Kaczynski is the like the the gray eminence behind the whole podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's been having moments lately. He has. He has. He had a had a big moment on my podcast. Unfortunately, for the wonderful Blake Masters, he said that you know because at the end of the podcast, very soon, I will ask you about the subversive thinker that you recommend, and he mentioned that he recommended. Uh, you know, the Unabomber to people. And that was used in quite a lot of attack ads. And I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't unprompt it. I just asked a question. So he, he came out and said, you know, I agree. I think it's fascinating, especially his description of, of kind of liberalism as, uh, as uh, over social uh, socialization and also it's a super interesting bit. Coincidentally, the man was, quite, you know, took his beliefs very literally and very practically, you know, he was an engineer by, by, by nature. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, Kaczynski is, is always looming. <laughs> so yeah, our connection fell off a little bit there, but we were discussing uh, Theodore Kaczynski. We're just uh, starting to say that you've, you've also explored his writings, uh, his controversial writings, and uh, uh, positively impressed. Yeah, like I said, his diagnosis is, is on point. And his, his conclusions are uh, a little bit of a non sequitur. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's the conclusion most people take when they, they find it. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. You know, it's uh, it, it feels to me like a test of someone's belief a little bit. You know, like we were saying, you know, people who believe that the the end is nigh, uh, either from climate change or from you know rogue AI. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that they're not, you know, Kaczynskiing is suspicious. But you know, it really takes someone extremely autistic to actually digest, go to the ends of the implications of a belief system and act on it. You know, um, someone like, like Nietzsche, who essentially, you know, drove himself insane through, uh, through digesting the implications of his belief system. 
Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, very few people do that. And maybe it's, maybe it's a healthy thing, but yeah, it's, uh, it also goes to show to see, you know, how, how frivolous ideology can be, you know, philosophy, you know, people like to talk. A lot of people are very good at talking. So they go into philosophy or history or discussion of, of politics because they're, they're good talkers, not necessarily because they're, they're good believers or they actually follow their, their beliefs uh, into, into where, wherever they lead them. But, you know, you have to wonder, given that Kaczynski was, seems to have been an autogonophile, if, if the you know, trans revolution had happened in his time, would he have sublimated all this by just becoming like you know, a women's distance runner or something like that and <laughs> left the philosophizing on the side? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe all the, you know, the the Leah Thomases and other, you know, just failed, you know, anarcho terrorists. <laughs> maybe it's it's good. Maybe men and women's sports is a good thing. I think, you know, this is this is a the heterodox view on on women's sports. You know, it's let let them go into women's sports to get their, you know, to to get their energy out. Who knows what else they'd be up to? Um, um, before before I wanna uh, I wanna let you go. I I wanna ask you the question of the show. Everyone gets this question, and it is about the heterodox or maybe just a subversive thinker that um, you think is underrated, or you you think you know people should just read more of or or understand better. Um, like a. Personality on Twitter, a writer. What's the what's could, the scope? Could, there's no there's no actual scope. I mean, it could be alive or dead. People have um, have you know mentioned video game developers, painters, um, poets, all sorts of you know singer songwriters, and anything goes. Whatever you think is um, is interesting. I mean, most people mention books, obviously, because that's a kind of more accessible thing. Uh, but yeah, it could be any sort of personality that you enjoy and you think, you know, also Twitter users, that's also some something people mention. So I know this is super broad scope, which usually makes the, the question even harder <laughs> because you don't exactly know where to anchor it and what to come up with. But yeah, just, um, yeah, think about it. You know, it could be, could be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, extremely revolutionary, but yeah, it's, uh, that's kind of the, the theme of the show. And I try to weave that in. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit on the spot. I have to, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Have to think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm glancing at my bookshelf looking for a, looking for a, yeah, that, this, you know, it's really funny because uh, I I get asked this question all the time on other people's podcasts because they're like, yeah, question of the show. So who is yours? I always just, you know, <laughs> panic order. I'm just like, uh, I never actually thought about this. Uh, look, Look around. Oh, um, this book that's coincidentally right next to me here. <laughs> it's awesome. It's the best. <laughs> it's like how you can really flummox someone if you just surprise them and say, N name 10 people. They'll be like, wait, well, huh? It's actually hard to do on the spot. Um, hmm, okay. Uh, someone that I wish other people would, would read or listen to. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give a really corny answer that at least brings the chat full circle. I think, I think people should read Rothbard if for no other reason than to have good criticisms of libertarianism. And, and he's, he's a fun and angry writer and a spirited writer. Um, so yeah, I, I think people should, should read Rothbard so that they can have better characters of, of libertarianism. Criticizing. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, a, a very fine answer. Um, and we haven't, I don't think I've had, I had Rothbard recommend it on the show yet because I tend to, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pretty cheap recommendation. I, no, I think it's, I, I think it's good. I think, you know, we're at the point where a lot of people are just jumping over libertarianism without understanding it because there are pretty strong criticisms just on their face. You know, you know, people making either on Twitter or on YouTube or something. It's like, we're at the point where you know people are literally laughing libertarianism out of the room, but the problem is that you know they're they're quite serious insights about what is possible and what isn't possible within libertarianism. So I think it's a very good recommendation. I think people should read Rothbard and and Mises as, as well. I think, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think very very good and yeah, keeping with the spirit of you know our discussion of libertarianism and its um, its final destination <laughs> and its consequences and everything. Um, perfect. So thank you so much, so much for coming on, Elon. Um, 
I want to point people toward your uh, Twitter, which is uh, at... Yeah, Twitter. Twitter's, Twitter's my only real presence. Elon Bachman. Twitter. Perfect. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. I know you, you've had a subsect, but I think you just posted 2021. So maybe you'll revive that. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, I really enjoy your post. I think people should follow you, uh, kind of, a, you know, I, I wouldn't say you're, there's no really good label for you. just a very thoughtful person who, you know, thinks deeply about things and, uh, presents his, uh, very, uh, cogent thoughts on, on, on Twitter. And yeah, that's a, the simplest way of describing it. And, you know, people should follow you and, uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you for all that and thanks for having me on.